things I love And I knew I had to run away, yeah And get down on my knees and pray, yeah That they go away Still it begins Needles and pins Because of all my pride The tears I gotta hide We are here today in Stony Batter to interview Alan Maximon, a long-time anarchist activist. Could you tell me a little about your background and how and when did you first get involved in politics? It was back at the, the very end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, uh, when I was very, very young, just going into my teens. But those were different times. There were a lot more pe young people in particular getting interested in left-wing politics. You have to remember, that was a time when, to a lot of people, it seemed that the, the world was up for change. The Vietnamese were beating the biggest army in the world. The Northern Civil Rights Movement had started. The American Civil Rights Movement had started clocking up successes. We saw the Black Panthers on TV. Um, we saw Prague in 68. It wasn't a question of whether you agreed or disagreed with any of those particular things. It was that this, this sense that change was really possible, that the world was in a ferment, there was a lot happening. Um, so, like, in school, I wasn't the only one getting interested in radical left-wing ideas. It, it wasn't the case of being the, the, the odd man out. There were several of us, a minority, obviously, but there were several of us. Uh, things like uh, finding Connolly pamphlets, going by the, the GPO on a Saturday afternoon and picking up various left-wing uh, papers, magazines. Because you have to remember, at that time, there was no internet. So if a left-wing group wants to get its ideas across, uh, it had to do it physically, like put a leaf with a paper or a magazine into somebody's hand. So Saturday afternoon outside the GPO on O'Connell Street, you could have a dozen, 15 different groups all selling their wares, uh, mainly Republican and left-wing groups, the occasional religious group, uh, quite different to the situation now where if people want to find stuff, they tend to go straight to Google and look it up, but we had no Google then. <laughs> and when did you get interested in the ideas of Marx? Well, pretty much the same time. Like a lot of us, started off with one or two pamphlets by Connolly, uh, because I suppose we'd heard of Connolly uh, because it wasn't that long since the 50th anniversary commemorations for 1916. So Connolly was being mentioned in the schools, like in history classes and so on. And Marx was also of interest because he was seen as the granddaddy of all these left-wing ideas and you could pick up very, very cheap pamphlets. Uh, we would going to New Books, which at the time was on Pier Street, beside the fire station. And in the equivalent, like, I suppose in today's body, like, you could pick up pamphlets for the equivalent of a euro or a euro fifty. So it wasn't that difficult. So I remember, like, getting a few things by Marx uh, that were easy enough to read and to understand, even at, at that delicate young age. Um, but I must admit, as I moved on and uh, started getting some of the more detailed economic stuff, I did sit there scratching my head wondering, am I just dumb? Am I the only one who doesn't understand this? Though a few years later, I said, no, definitely not. And could you tell me about your involvement in uh, Fish with Sinn Féin? Well, in the early 70s, there, as I said, like there was a ferment, there was all sorts of new ideas floating around, new movements, things that had never really been considered before. And one of the areas that happened in was the secondary schools. Uh, the Irish Union of School Students was set up by a gang of 14, 15, 16 year olds. Uh, 
Uh, it eventually grew to about 7,000 paid up members around the country, pulled off a few school strikes, had a, a real organisation for a few years. For I suppose what it argued would have marked those years of, of optimism, sort of early to mid 70s. And I got involved in that. And there I met quite a number of people who were either interested in or were members of left wing groups, particularly the Young Socialists and Official Sinn Fein. And official Sinn Féin at the time seemed most attractive to me in that it was large. Um, it, at the time it wasn't dogmatic at all. It was actually undergoing like a, a big sort of internal debate about where you went from traditional physical force republicanism, how you became a modern left-wing movement. So there were all sorts of ideas floating around. It was quite an exciting period. And when you're young, you know, particularly, things like that could be quite exciting. Uh, a lot of reading, a lot of talking, a lot of getting involved in things. And after, you know, I, I ended up joining official Sinn Féin with quite a, quite a number of other people of my own age. At that time, the officials had maybe 300 members in Dublin. Other left-wing groups were counting their their membership in double figures so you know as somebody in the early teens that was the place to be if you wanted to have some effect and would you have a lot of trouble with the police at that time because you were involved with official Sinn Féin what tended to happen was you anyone who joined official Sinn Féin within a few weeks you'd get a visit at home from the branch uh, I think essentially trying to A, suss out how serious you are about this and B, to try and frighten you off. But I suppose it was, previous, it was happening to everybody showing any real interest in left-wing politics. So it wasn't a huge surprise, a huge bolt out of the blue. Yes, got several visits at home. I, got, I even got one visit at school, uh, which presumably the intention there was to try and get teachers to to put pressure on me, but needless to say, it didn't work. And at that time, did you know Seamus Costello? And uh, what view did you have of the IRSP when they were established uh, some years later? I didn't know Costello very well. What I can remember was that I, to me, he struck me as quite... Um, uh, what some people would call a forceful leader, what others might call maybe a bit of an autocratic uh, leader. Now, he he did have a, a certain charisma. Quite a number of people very loyal to him personally over the years. However, I suppose it was also, I didn't share his politics that he was arguing essentially that the, the official Republican movement needed to recommence war against the British Army, whereas most of us, the vast majority in the official movement at the time, had come to the conclusion that several hundred men and women going out with guns at the end of the day wasn't going to defeat a huge empire. And secondly, that no matter what our intentions were, we were being very, very misunderstood by the majority of the working class in the six counties. And, as I said, despite all the good intentions, it's a real fear that any escalation of military activities would only fuel the, the, the sectarian fervour that was there at the time. You have to remember, this was a time of daily sectarian murders, uh, people afraid in Belfast to go for a drink any, almost anywhere further than the end of their own street. Um, it, it is literally the case, and it's hard to... I suppose for people to get to grips with now that hardly a day went by without somebody being killed purely because of their religion or their supposed religion that they were on the wrong side of the street or they were on the wrong street after the pubs closed and dragged into a car, taken away and murdered. And yeah, so Costo, I think, downplayed the, the, the threat there. And maybe some of us uh, saw a greater threat than there was. But there was a, a very real division between what I suppose you'd have to say were the militarists and the people who wanted to take a political road. And by political road, I don't mean at that time that they just wanted to get people elected, but also to go out and I suppose, win a battle for hearts and minds, a battle of ideas. Uh, we all felt this great idea of socialism and people were 
really enthusiastic about wanting to go and spread it, talk about, talk to people about it. Uh, so in a way, yeah, there was there was quite a division there, despite Costello only being about 15 miles down the road where it was ours, we would have said at the time, only two common areas away, um, there would have been practically no, say, socialising between his supporters and other people. At that time, the, the disagreements were starting to get relatively bitter. And... Uh could you tell me about the People's Democracy's long march from Belfast to Dublin? And uh, could you give your view of the People's Democracy? Well, the long march, the idea was, the sound of that, this was, I think, 1970? Yeah, it could have been Might have been 69. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, to make the point that the 26 counties, uh, that in the 26 counties there was a need for a civil rights movement as well, that civil rights wasn't just a question of Catholics or people from the nationalist community in the north being denied equality. Those were the days when you didn't have a vote in local government elections unless you were a ratepayer, which meant that, meant that, for instance, if you were renting, you'd never have a vote. But business people were entitled to several votes because of the number of premises they were paying rates on, uh, when housing allocation was decided by local councils. So if you had a unionist-controlled local council, uh, well, they weren't in a hurry to build houses for Catholics because they saw that as increasing the Catholic vote in the area and eventually it could threaten uh, local unionist control. The most uh, notorious example probably was Derry, where you had three local election wards uh, most of the Catholics were essentially pushed into one ward. So they might be the majority in the, the city at the time, but they were a minority electorally. That sort of thing was happening all over the place. In Fermanagh, of, say, school bus drivers, I think, if I remember correctly, there were 36 of them. Only one was a Catholic. So obviously there was a huge need for a civil rights movement to address this story. But people's democracy would make the point there was also a need in the South because of the denial of basic rights like divorce, like contraception, and they particularly on the march drew attention to censorship in the South. Because your man John McGuffin, is that his name, who became an anarchist, wasn't he one of the people responsible for that march? He was, yeah. They're, they're not everybody, if I remember correctly, I'm, like I wasn't involved in the organisation of the Red Thing. I was just there when it arrived in Dublin. I remember it was a, a sit-down outside the GPO. Not really sure why anybody sat down, because I think the guards had blocked off the street anyway, but I guess that's what you did then. Um, there was controversy within the left about this. There were elements on the left saying, no, you shouldn't at the moment be drawing attention to the lack of basic rights in the South, that somehow this is playing in the hands of the, the, the orange machine in the North. Now, obviously, any real socialist would say rubbish to that. Um, we, we want rights for everybody, and we don't put anybody on the back burner. But there was a, there was a tension over it. Um, there was also a misunderstanding, I think. The Gale talked civil rights movement had agreed to march from Galway and to join the People's Democracy March in Dublin they wanted to draw attention to particularly the lack of jobs at the time in the Gaelthacht areas in the, the West despite the government's supposed uh, support for language revival. Uh, halfway through they decided to pull out because they'd been told that People's Democracy were calling for abortion in the South uh, the thing was, one, nobody had mentioned abortion, and it's probably a sign of the times, and maybe how much we've changed in the 40 years since then, that clearly some people completely confused contraception with abortion. It was just like, it was, it was all that stuff that the church was against, and it should But anyway, that was sorted out, and the people from the Gaeltacht agreed to resume the march, and did join up with the People's Democracy in uh, O'Connell Street. Okay. And could you tell me a little about the anarchists and left wing groups in Ireland in the 1970s, 80s? 70s and 80s, you had the main players on the left were definitely the official Republicans and then what became the Workers' Party. Their greatest success, I would think, 
was not getting seven TDs elected into the Dáil, but rather the way they used the tax reform campaign of the late 70s. This was a campaign organ with, with a lot of uh, Workers' Party people uh, incredibly active in it, but a campaign organised by the trade union movement looking for a more equitable tax system, not for tax cuts in the sense that it would be a, a smaller tax take, we wanted more tax taken, but we wanted the burden to be on the rich and not on the PAYE taxpayer. And it led to uh, probably the biggest demonstration ever in the history of the state, a few one-day strikes and so on. But what the Workers' Party did at the time was they used every opportunity they got on the media and so on to hammer home the point that people should be proud to be working class, that the working class pay for everything in the country. It wasn't something to be ashamed of. You shouldn't feel a need to run around and see yourself as lower middle class or something like that. That being working class should be a badge of pride. And I think that probably was their greatest contribution at the time. Now, other groups on the left, you had the, the, the IRSP, the Irish Republican Socialist Party, uh, which maybe started off with four or five hundred members. It's hard to know. I think they claimed 800 at the start, but everybody lies about those things. Uh, but it very quickly went into decline for various reasons. There was the, the feud between them and the official IRA. There was probably the predominance of hard men within the, the leadership of the IRSP, which meant politics became increasingly a secondary thing and militarism was what it was all about. Uh, they were very prone to internal feuding, which wasn't just people bickering at each other or, or spilling somebody's pint. These were feuds where people got shot dead. Um, and um, we also increasingly saw sort of gangster elements um, if not running the, the, the show, certainly being tolerated there. So the IRSP, well, in Dublin anyway, was relatively isolated in terms of the left. The only real support or friends they had were one or two of the smaller Trotskyist groups. Now, there were a number of Trotskyist groups, far more than there are now. Um, they were all relatively small. A few grew like the Socialist Workers Movement, which became today's Socialist Workers Party, or the Militant Tendency, which became the, the Socialist Party of today. Many others just disappeared from the scene, like uh, I don't think anybody remembers the League for a Workers' Vanguard, or, you know, there, there were many, 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 many others. Is this like where that. people like Seamus Healy came from? Well, similar name group. The League for Workers' Vanguard was a breakaway from the League for a Workers' Republic, <laughs> um, and prominent in that were Seamus Healy, now the South Tipperary TD, and his brother Paddy, also involved, uh, was uh, the Irish Times journalist Carol Coulter. Uh, but that's a group that I think faded out of existence in the probably the, the mid 80s. Most of the, the Trotskyist groups at the time were small, stayed small, and a lot of them oriented around the Republican movement, particularly the, the provisionals, in that they, they thought that the, the national question, the question of the border of Irish unification, would be the spark for much bigger things. So they saw their role as advising and encouraging what they saw as the more left-wing elements of republicanism. What other people would say is that they just became mere cheerleaders for Republican militarism. Um, could I ask you about some of the central figures active on the left and within anarchism at the time? Some of little is known about. Well, on the left at the time, there weren't a huge number of people that would be seen as all-encompassing. Like today, you could talk of Joe Higgins in Ireland, Tony, you know, the late Tony Benn in Britain and so on. We didn't really have anybody like that here. The closest you came to it were Bernadette Devon, later Bernadette McAlisky, 
Uh, Eamon McCann, from, who was at the time Derry Labour Party and later become a leading member of the Socialist Workers Party, Michael Farrell of the, the People's Democracy, as I said, uh, Paddy Healy from the League for Republic, Brian Trench, the, the journalist, uh, the Socialist Workers Movement. But in the sense of leaders known widely beyond their own, I don't know, support, beyond left circles, the sort of people who could get maybe on the Late Late Show or get interviewed on the news, that was very few. It would have been mainly, I think, Bernadette and Eamon McCann. Um, just moving on now, uh, could I ask you about the Irish anti-nuclear movement? Yeah, well, this was, people often wonder, like, uh, why does Ireland have no nuclear power? Well, because people stopped it here. Uh, I'm sorry, was it in the 70s, wasn't it? It was in the, 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 the 70s, mm. I think, yeah. Um, i trying to remember the exact years. It was the very end of the 70s, anyway, when the Irish government proposed building not one, but four nuclear reactors at Carrotsor Point in Wexford. And... I suppose, like with many environmental things, a few people were asking questions, and is it that safe? And there just been the, the Three Mile Island near meltdown in America. There was a growing anti-nuclear movement in Europe, particularly, if I remember correctly, in Germany. And some people got together. They decided that they would organise a music festival down at Carnesore Point to draw attention to this and to try and build a, a movement and graffiti started appearing all over the country. Get to the point. Well, people got to the point. Several thousand went down. We had, uh, and it was a very, very broad for Knowing that we have musicians that you might have expected at the time playing like Christy Moore. We also had Christa Berg. <laughs> very, very broad front. Uh, the following year there was another festival which was even bigger. Uh, Anti-nuclear movements were set up in most uh, cities and towns around the country. In Dublin at its height there would have been, I think, at least 20 local groups. And these were groups who were doing things like leafleting their neighbourhoods, holding little information pickets outside local ESB offices, fundraising to um, hire buses to bring people to maybe demonstrations in other areas. And for a while it was quite a vibrant movement. It uh, had very, very broad appeal. Very quickly all the opinion polls were showing a majority of people opposed to nuclear power. Every third or fourth car you saw going through the streets of Dublin or indeed anywhere else in the country seemed to have a, a nuclear power no thanks sticker on the back of it. And at the end of the day the government ended up uh, tearing up the plans for the uh, the nuclear reactors there. Uh, no Irish government has dared to dared since to propose uh, building a nuclear power plant in this country. Yeah. Could I ask you about the Irish anti-apartheid movement and the Duns workers' strike in support of the boycott of South African goods? The Duns strike in the, the, the mid-80s was, well, for me one of the most impressive, one of the most inspiring uh, industrial disputes that has been in this country. The Shop Workers Union, the union that today is known as Mandate, had just had its conference, and at that conference a motion was passed calling on people to boycott South African goods and calling on shop workers to refuse to handle South African goods. This being done in response to calls from the, the, the mass movement in South Africa, the people directly affected, who would be directly affected by a boycott, were calling for it. Uh, the South African trade unions, the ANC, the United Democratic Front, any organisation of any size and stature in South Africa was saying, we want a boycott of everything South African until the apartheid regime is pulled down. Usually when motions like that are passed at union conferences, people mean well that, but there often isn't much action on them, that they're, they're sometimes like just a way of saying, yeah, we're with you guys, but uh, that's about it. This time, however, young shop steward in Duns in Henry Street in Dublin, Karen Guerin, went, told her members about this. They all said, well, yeah, like if... That's what our union has decided. Yep, yeah, we'll go with it. Day later, woman comes up to the checkout. The checkout operator, Mary Manning, sitting there. Woman takes out a couple of, I think it was outspan uh, oranges. Uh, and Mary says, uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, I can't take for those. We're 
boycotting South Africa and goods here because of apartheid. And the woman said, yeah, fine, no problem. Manager, of course, who was hovering nearby was less than pleased. Uh, Mary was uh, out the door <laughs> in minutes flat. And 11 of her colleagues walked out with her. Uh, and later... Sorry, which was tough, because the, there wasn't much work then. The 80s were tough. There was very, very little work. It was a time of high unemployment and high emigration. The union... Uh, immediately made it a, an official dispute. Pickets went on. Um, at, we very quickly moved to 24-hour pickets on the store because, because the sort of issue it was, uh, very quickly a support group came together, people who wanted to give a dig out to make sure that the whole burden didn't rest on a dozen young workers. These were all uh, young women, one young man there, all in their late teens, very early 20s. Um, people determined to give them a hand to raise money to supplement their strike pay, that they shouldn't be be suffering any more than at least was, was necessary as a result of the courageous stand they'd taken. So like I said, we, we fairly quickly moved to 24-hour pickets on the store. Uh, they could only get supplies in by using sort of non-union third-party outfits. Uh, we found that they were having deliveries uh, rerouted to other venues and then picked up by sort of white van men to bring to the shop. So sometimes there'd even be a bit of, a bit of scuffling um, around the delivery entrance. Sometimes we'd turn them away, sometimes we wouldn't. Sometimes guards would turn a blind eye, sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, the dispute went on and on and on. After nine months, the picket was lifted to allow for government intervention without the government being accused of bending under pressure because politicians are very sensitive about things like that and at the end of the day after a long long delay the outcome was that the 26 county government banned all imports of South African fruit, vegetables, agricultural produce and that ban remained in place until apartheid was ended in South Africa so it was a tremendous achievement for a handful of young workers who took their trade unionism incredibly seriously. And most of those young workers, well, they're not young anymore, uh, not old either. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, it wasn't a one off thing for them. You will run into, if you know them, you will run into them at major events around the city. I'm quite sure you will find them on, you know. The, the struggles against the, the, the water charge, you would have found them on uh, demonstrations in sympathy with the, the Palestinian people being uh, bombed by the Israelis and so on. I saw her dream. I saw her face, it was a face I loved, and I knew I had to run away, yeah.